Hi everyone, welcome to our first uh, of a series of live and live and in-person and online events. We're doing an Ask a Rheumatologist here with the Lupus Foundation of Northern California. Today we have Dr. Lee and Dr. Chai Chin, and they're gonna be answering your questions. We have a couple questions that are already pre-written that we'll start out with, and then we can take your live questions. But I wanted to welcome you to our series, and again, here's Dr. Lee and Dr. Chai Chin, and we'll start out with the questions that we have submitted from previous, um, from the online previous things. All right, thanks a lot, here you go. Thank you. So, yeah, so I can, you want to you, Hi, so I'm uh, Dr. Yashar Chaichi and I'm a rheumatologist at Stanford. Uh, I see adult rheumatology patients. Um, I've been here for about a year and a half. I'm excited to uh, share with you uh, some of our uh, insights and uh, about lupus and hopefully uh, help you sort of navigate through um, the illness and educate yourself more about the disease. Um, and excited to be here with Dr. Lee as well. Hi, I'm Zalan Lee. I'm one of the pediatric rheumatologists here at Stanford. Um, I've been here at Stanford for 16 years now, um, and I'm just really excited to be part of this and um, continuing to educate and um, uh, make sure that all our patients are our advocates. Um, and so we're, we're happy to answer any questions, and I think we have a few to start out with while people are, are coming online. Um, and the first one, we can start uh, quickly is uh, do we say who or um, we just, just the first ask name. the question okay so this one is from Stacy um, and she says I've recently been diagnosed with lupus is there any solid information on the safety of black widow during breastfeeding so you know I, I can tackle this question so um, as, as a patient with lupus as you know um, black widow sort of is the cornerstone foundation medication we use um, in patients uh, ideally, everybody with lupus, if they don't have a contraindication, if they tolerate the medication. Um, and so um, we use it routinely in the setting of pregnancy. It's thought to have a very good safety profile during pregnancy. And then during um, breastfeeding, which is the focus of this question, uh, I think there was some early literature, you know, several decades ago or even 15 years ago or so, where it was still some uncertainty whether it was safe or not. There's been actually a lot of long term data, including some of it. Um, uh, I think here at Stanford previously as well, looking at sort of the long-term effects and accumulating data. And, and generally, it's the consensus that it's actually a very safe uh, profile during lactation, and both rheumatologists and uh, obstetricians uh, routinely recommend it in this setting, both sort of in terms of guidelines and sort of governing bodies, and also just empirically when I've you know shared patients with them. So um, I think. Um, you know, there's, there's a number of studies. There was a study looking at infants up to a year of age and closely monitoring them for any developmental you know, difficulties or other subtle differences, and they really found no difference between those who had gotten it or hadn't gotten it. So um, I think you can be rest assured that it's something that is safe. Specifically, the, the question is always, is it you know, excreted in breast milk? And it's really at like a very small amount and sort of not an amount that's gonna you know, cause any you know, untoward effects. So I think the consensus is that if you're on it, your lupus is stable, you should be on it to keep that stable, and also you shouldn't worry about it in the setting of breastfeeding. And um, as a pediatric rheumatologist, we prescribe it to our kids, you know, they're, they're our patients, or uh, their children. So um, I think we feel very comfortable with it, um, and we have very young children on it. So again, I think that helps support the fact that um, I think you feel it's very safe. Perfect. Um, the next one is from Christina, and she asks, how does lupus affect the eyes? I was told that LASIK surgery is not possible with lupus. Is this true? So specifically, I guess, with the question of LASIK, I don't think at this time there's, um, there's not a large-scale study or you know, a, a large body of evidence specifically with LASIK, but there have been reports um, and concerns just generally in patients who have connective tissue disease, lupus included, that the procedure may incite sort of uh, local inflammatory response and may sort of worsen autoimmunity. So I think it's best to, certainly in a patient whose lupus is otherwise prone to be active or has high disease activity, this may not be the surgery, um, you know, vision corrective surgery that would be for you as a patient, but it should be sort of individualized between your rheumatologist and your ophthalmologist and sort of on a case by case basis, there may be settings where it, uh, it could be safe. I just think there's, it's still something to be determined with more data. Um, sort of more broadly, how does lupus affect the eyes? Um, 
actually fairly broadly, there's a lot, obviously there's a lot of structures within the eye, but lupus can affect a number of them. Um, so you can get commonly actually, it's really just dry eyes, you know, um, which we see um, a lot of time. And whether that's, in some cases it's from the lupus, secondary Sjogren syndrome um, is fairly common in lupus and the dry eyes could be from that as well. Um, sometimes that can secondarily lead to corneal abrasions or even corneal ulcers. So that's something that's seen less common in lupus. Um, another important structure of the eye for your vision is the retina. Um, you can get a, what's called a vasculitis or inflammation of the blood vessels supplying the retina. Um, and that can be very painful, it can be vision threatening, and that often requires significant immunosuppression to treat. Um, you can get um, other types of what's called inflammatory eye disease. Um, one structure is called the uvea, one's called the sclera, so either of those can be affected um, in lupus as well. Um, the, and then the important thing is obviously, is this um, effect of the lupus or the medication or other things as well? So you always want to rule out, if you're on immunosuppression, could this be an infectious cause of eye involvement? That's certainly something that your ophthalmologist can, can help with. Uh, and then we, Plaquenil um, can rarely, but it's important to know, and, and um, any of you who are on Plaquenil are aware of that there's a, r a rare risk of toxicity to the macula, which is important for central vision. It's very rare. It's typically only seen after five years. So those are the important things to think about. Um, and, um, and so with appropriate screening of the eye, um, that can be sort of, the risk can be sort of mitigated and, and typically it's reversible if it's detected early. Um, and then steroids, which unfortunately are often needed to control lupus and hopefully for short periods of time only, but that can also cause cataracts, can cause glaucoma. So, so the answer is yes, lupus can affect the eye in multiple ways, um, but it's important to think about um, whether it's related to the disease, your treatment, and looking at sort of other factors that could be playing into it. With, um, and I think that's uh, what's really important is also to continue to see an ophthalmologist yeah. on a regular basis, just so you can be monitored for all the things that um, Dr. Chia Chen um, had uh, talked about because I think um, it's it's important uh, to look for side effects from the meds, potential risk for infection in the eyes, um, and then obviously just lupus causing um, inflammation in the eyes as well. Um, so uh, we, we had, and I want to defer to you for the adults, but I think in, in children we say every six months for um, an eye check. And I don't what what do you usually recommend? It's variable. I mean, for if they're on chloroquine, we do every six months. I generally we do annually. Although there are relatively more recent guidelines from the American Academy of Ophthalmology for Plaquenil that if you're a low risk patient in, in, in terms of risk of toxicity from Plaquenil, there's various factors that go into that. Some ophthalmologists advocate you can get an eye exam at baseline and then wait five years because that risk is mainly at five years and then get one annually. Sometimes it, it's, it's sort of individualized, but there are, there are Yeah, differences. and the risk for toxicity does go up as you as are you. on it longer. And if your dose is too high, if you have other sort of factors that might play into that. Can I ask you one question? So yeah. there's somebody that has uh, retinitis pigmentosa, oh. and they were told never to take Plaquenil. What are other options aside from Plaquenil that you can take if you... So based on that, then chloroquine would also not be an option because it has even more eye toxicity. Yeah. So that's a related anti-malarial we often use that can be very effective for lupus. I would say if they still needed, and which we often try to, if they needed an anti-malarial medication sort of to control your lupus in the background, um, for you, because of what you have with the, the pigment, the uh, pigmentosis, pigmentosis uh, the retina, uh, quinacrine is actually an anti-malarial that is not really thought to have any uh, appreciable uh, eye toxicity. Um, so that would be an option. Some patients would maybe, if you didn't want to be on an antimalarial, you could control it. If you had other disease manifestations of your lupus that you needed to be on something stronger, like Celsept or other medications we often use, that could maybe be enough to control the lupus otherwise. So. Yeah, you don't necessarily have to be on you don't have to. You don't have to. Yeah. We have patients who do fine without it. So exactly. It's, exactly. It's just, okay, thank yeah. you. Um, okay, another question or, oh, okay, is from Michaela B. Um, any, anyone, uh, anyone have stretch marks from prednisone? I'm 23 and have had them since the age of 15. They're my biggest insecurity. How do you cope and have you found a way to treat them? So um, we definitely, especially in kids and adolescents, um, where they're growing a lot, we, we actually see quite a bit of stress marks. Obviously, um, uh, children with lupus, uh, they're on strong medicines and uh, steroids um, that can cause uh, changes in their weight. 
see that as that they're significant. Um, so we actually see quite a lot of stretch marks. Um, there's actually been a lot out there for stretch marks. Um, uh, I usually just start with vitamin E, uh, a cream or a oil, um, and, um, and some time. The thing with stretch marks is that they get better over time. Um, and I think the beginning is when they are the, the most prominent and being purplish and very large. And over time, as, um, as your body's healing and your, your lupus is becoming more under control, um, the, the skin will, will sort of come back to your uh, normal color or maybe get to turn a little bit uh, lighter as well. Um, uh, there are a couple other things that we all also sometimes will re recommend. There's a, um, a cream called Strivectin. And that has actually helped with uh, stretch marks for some people, so that's an option as well. Um, and uh, there's also lots of other ones on the market too. And I, I'm not necessarily I don't I don't have anything uh, with Strivectin or with vitamin E oil or anything. But these are the ones that we've heard um, from our patients that have have worked really well. Um, and then lastly, there is um, uh, cosmetic surgery as a as a possibility, and we have had uh, patients do that as well, uh, just as an option to think about. Do you want to take a couple live questions and then... Let's do this one last one. Oh, I'm, I'm seeing them here now. Sure. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah, got it. Okay. The, the one last question that uh, came in was, um, uh, I'm, I have lupus. I'm worried about my, my soon-to-be three-year-old son. About my soon-to-be three-year-old son, he occasionally gets butterfly rashes, and when we give him melatonin, his rash appears. Um, how young can, can you be diagnosed with lupus, and um, how is lupus diagnosed in children? Uh, so, uh, it's, it's rare to have extremely young lupus, so uh, infant lupus. Um, usually we don't, uh, on average, we usually see our, our lupus patients start around six at the youngest. Um, but that doesn't mean it, it's definite, but that's sort of um, on average, um, sort of the younger group that we see. And then it uh, goes um, more and more as we get up into the teenage years, and that's the most common is um, young um, uh, adolescent women. Um, with regards to to um, how it's diagnosed, it's it's exactly the same way it's diagnosed as an adult uh, with the criteria. Um, we obviously look at all the different lab lab evaluations and uh, physical exam and um, and all the symptoms. Um, Interestingly enough, in kids, they actually have a little bit more organ system involvement than in adults. Um, and so we are a little bit more careful and screen the kidneys, the liver, the lungs uh, routinely in kids um, because uh, they have a higher risk of having involvement. Um, so yeah. We have a question about the symptoms uh, that are common in children with uh -huh. lupus while you're talking about the children with lupus. So what symptoms are common in children? So like I said, you can a lot of times they'll they'll present with um, kidney involvement, so that uh, they, they'll have um, abnormal colored urine or stop making urine. They might be puffy from um, them not peeing enough. Um, uh, they can have arthritis, so joint symptoms. They they can definitely have the rash, the malar rash, the butterfly rash. Um, Sometimes they might have heart and lung involvement as well, inflammation around those organs too. Um, so it's, I think, very similar to adults, um, lupus can present in many different ways. Um, and so it's not, that's not, not any different than adults. Cool, great. Um, okay, we have a couple questions here on the chat. Uh, Laura has two questions. First, she said, I started taking Plaquenil 40 days ago and now I have arthritis. Have you ever heard of that? I have I haven't heard of that specifically. I mean, it's it's the thing with Plaquenil is that it's generally a slow-acting medication. Um, some patients do feel some symptoms sort of within that time frame, or generally improvement, because one of the main indications for Plaquenil is that it's particularly effective for the joints. Um, but the sort of the, the really the it kicks in two, three, four, even up to six months later. So it'd be less common. And for it to flare the arthritis, I would think I would be more uh, suspicious that maybe your lupus is actually flaring up a little bit sort of independent of the Plaquenil and sort of your rheumatologist queuing in on that being reevaluated closely looking for any subtle signs of a rash um, other evidence of disease activity whether it's sores or on your labs your markers might be a little bit different um, generally I mean there are sort of the more short-term side effects some tend to be sometimes GI upset if 
some patients don't tolerate it or other things, but um, in this case, I would, I would be more worried that it may be manifestation of your lupus. Yeah, and I, I would agree. I think you can't necessarily chalk it all up to maybe a side effect from the med. Um, I think you have to look at the whole picture, and, and sometimes maybe the meds you're on aren't, aren't actually adequately treating your activity, disease activity, and maybe you're just progressing and, and having some more now joint symptoms as well. Um, and then she also was asking, and, and I know we had this question other times, she just said, I lost my hair with lupus, um, not from the drug, just from the lupus. Mm -hmm. Is there any luck with drugs to treat this aspect? So basically, what can she do to help with hair loss? So it can be difficult just talking to my colleagues in dermatology. It's, so it's not necessarily one of the easiest manifestations of lupus to treat. The question is, so, um, I mean, first of all, you're, you're often with, with working with your dermatologist, they'll want to make sure it's not due to like alopecia areata, which is another type of um, hair loss, typically patchy. So there are certain clues based on the appearance and distribution that can look into other causes of autoimmune hair loss. First, you want to look at other common causes such as iron deficiency or thyro, you know, uh, low thyroid. Other things could do that. It's, those are all excluded. The other question is, um, Generally, the hair loss can sort of can often correlate with evidence of disease activity elsewhere. If your disease is active elsewhere with your lupus, and this is sort of coinciding with that, then treating your lupus appropriately, more aggressively, whether you need to be on um, a more immunosuppression, may help this if this is directly related to that. Sometimes the hair loss can be very localized, and you may have what's called discoid lupus or a specific lesion in the scalp that typically causes more of a scarring hair loss at the site of those lesions. So if that's what's going on, then that is typically not necessarily treated systemically, but you could you know, either get topical steroids, other topical treatments, lesional steroids, different things that's more of a dermatologic approach. But um, there's a you know, sort of lupus hair has a sort of some, sometimes kind of have a characteristic appearance, um, but sometimes it can be tricky to differentiate from other causes of hair loss. And, but it sounds like in, in your case, medications like steroids or, or methotrexate if is sometimes used in lupus for arthritis, those don't seem to be playing into it, so it does sound like it, it is from your lupus. So the question is, if it's isolated hair thinnings, that can be sometimes tricky to treat unless your lupus is active otherwise. Sometimes something over the counter called biotin can be helpful, um, usually at a dose of um, like five milligrams um, per day. Um, so that's sometimes advocated and patients would have some success with that, but um, it just depends on um, looking at the whole picture of your lupus in terms of how to specifically treat it. I definitely think for all the things that we talk about with regards to the meds and um, the stuff that um, we're talking about, you should definitely um, go back to your rheumatologist to, to make sure that they feel comfortable with adding any of these supplements right. um, that we're, we're suggesting um, and, and the, the dosage as well. Because right. everything um, can be slightly different for you. So um, if there's another question, should children with lupus follow a specific diet? And I guess we can address that with everyone, diet, yeah, should everybody, yeah. anybody. I can weigh in on an adult lupus Perfect, diet. yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, for children, as they are growing um, and trying to build you know, their bodies in, um, for the rest of their lives, um, it's really important to actually have a good, well-balanced diet. So I think um, restrictive diet uh, is, is very, um, we have to be really careful and cautious about it. We, we don't tend to um, recommend any specific uh, special diets. I think a well-balanced diet is, and a heart-healthy diet is uh, um, good. Um, we do talk about the anti-inflammatory diet where um, um, you, know, you can add uh, flaxseed oil and, and uh, um, uh, omega-3 and those kind of things. Um, and I think those are, are great and they're, and they're good for just general health too, so that definitely highly recommended as well. Um, and I don't even really say to necessarily stay away from certain types of foods. I know people ask about that too. Um, I think the biggest one I've have heard um, we talk a little bit about is alfalfa sprouts, yeah. but that's the, that's the really the the biggest one that we're saying. You know, they don't even taste that good anyway. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> you know, we won't miss it. Yeah. Um, but that that's that's really um, our, my just if it's really important for the kids to actually grow and so we really don't recommend a lot of restricting and I kind of echo everything dr. Lee is saying there's really so generally I advocate because there's low risk of harm like an anti-inflammatory diet can be you know 
it's just because it overlaps a lot with a sort of a general healthy diet. Um, I don't sort of discourage patients against trying an anti-inflammatory diet. So things that are high in omega-3, like certain sort of fatty, uh, uh, like fish, um, lean proteins, uh, a variety of certain certain types of vegetables have a lot of omega-3. That can be helpful. There's not rigorous, it's not rigorously been studied in lupus specifically that that changes sort of outcomes, um, but. Um, it, it makes sense so that's something that can be pursued uh, again in close communication with your rheumatologist um, again other than potentially alfalfa sprouts just because it contains a substance that may sort of promote infl inflammation there's not specific foods that have been conclusively shown that you should avoid in lupus but just overall especially more at, I think in pediatric as well but in adult there's a higher cardiovascular risk in lupus patients independent of if you have high blood pressure or cholesterol issues so because of that, sort of making sure your diet is at least heart healthy, doing all you can to, to further that, that specifically makes sense in your diet, but specifically avoiding this or that, or uh, I think is less important than just being consistent with the overall healthy diet. Perfect. Can you add this? So the top one says how is AVN, which is avascular necrosis associated with lupus? So yeah, so avascular necrosis, sometimes called osteonecrosis, um, but it's basically you, you um, lose or severely impact the blood flow to the bone. Common locations are like the hip or the shoulder. Um, sometimes it's due to clots, sometimes it's not, but it's fairly frequent in, in patients with lupus. Some of the risk factors are actually just having lupus increases your risk to somebody who does not have lupus for this. Um, long standing um, or even high doses of steroids are a major risk factor for it. So. Having lupus and being on steroids does increase your risk as well. Um, uh, as you may or may not be aware, antiphospholipid antibodies are these proteins in the blood that can be associated with a higher risk of clotting or miscarriages. Those are fairly frequently associated with lupus, um, and actually probably the most common association in rheumatology. And that also increases your risk. So um, it's something to be aware of, and sort of the things to watch out for as a patient are, obviously lupus can cause arthritis, but the, the Thing that's different about this is it tends not to be like your typical small joints that lupus affects like I said your hip or a shoulder often is like pain wakes you up at night pain at um, uh, just even speaking a tiny bit louder just a little louder talking. okay pain at night pain sort of uh, even just barely moving your legs so it's a very distinctive type of a symptom that would be something to uh, alert your rheumatologist about and if you have the risk factors for it, it would be something they would want to look for they could look at it um, on, a, on an x-ray to see some early changes, but sometimes that can be missed, so um, it may require sort of further imaging to diagnose, and, and the treatment just depends on how severe or how advanced it is, but it's, it's something that rheumatologists, orthopedic uh, specialists are well aware of and can guide you through if that is something that you're dealing with. Yeah, and I think uh, symptom-wise, it, it, can, it can be sort of the gamut of uh, just sort of annoying pain, um, and then go to pretty severe to, you know, where it sort of uh, impacts your mobility. Um, and um, I think the key is that it doesn't necessarily get better with any of the treatments they, they try, if, you know. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, if it just persists, uh, think about um, avascular necrosis or AVN. Yeah. Can you um, explain a little bit about the, um, the treatments for AVN, like the, the, the core decompression or the bone decompression or um, the hip replacements, or is it better to just do absolutely nothing? <laughs> I mean, that's a, it's, it's a hard question to yeah, answer because is. a lot of that is dependent on your orthopedic surgeon and, and it depends on how typically MRI criteria, how advanced the AVN has been, how chronic it is, how much in, of loss of sort of the joint space and all of those sort of uh, sort of anatomical factors weigh in on how much do you do you, do you need a full joint replacement? Do these sort of bridge surgeries in between? So it's it's hard to answer, I think. Um, I mean, I think especially if it happens in children, it, um, they really try and want to preserve as much as they can before they go to a joint replacement because joint replacements have a life and, and you're going to outlive that and you'll have multiple replacements. So so I think that's part of it as well. But I, I do think it's dependent on each each individual. Yeah. So we really can't um, say what is best, um, what's your best treatment for, for um, a certain person. And it also depends on how symptomatic you are from it. You know, if, if it's, it, there's, so there's so, too, so many various variables both how it looks to the to the orthopedic surgeon, how he, how it's impacting your quality of life, and 
so um, just because the decision to go to surgery is, can be a major decision, so. And do you want to do anything for you? I'll call yeah. it a CNS lupus. <laughs> yeah. So, so CNS stands for Central Nervous System Lupus. Um, it's a very broad statement just because mm -hmm. CN, the Central Nervous System can, so any, any structure in your brain, any structure in your spinal cord, I mean, that's your Central Nervous System. There's a lot of structures there. A lot of, the answer, the short answer is it's fairly common, um, unfortunately, because it's one of the significant causes of, um, you know, major flares that can be sometimes life-threatening depending on the specific manifestation. So sort of, we talk about lupus as being sort of, you know, organ sort of threatening or non-organ threatening. So there are sort of milder forms, skin, joints involved, and then there are patients who develop this. And it's actually in a, up to, in some series, 20, 30% of patients when they first present with lupus can have some form of CNS lupus. And then sort of over the course of your disease, it's not uncommon to get it as well. But again, it, it can range from mild, you know, headaches. confusion, mild mm -hmm. headaches, confusion here and there, maybe not feeling quite right, but still being very functional yeah. and, and carrying on with your job and family and social responsibilities, to being debilitating seizures. Um, you can get developed strokes, whether that's from the lupus itself, from a vasculitis, again, which is an inflammation of the blood vessels, or from that antiphospholipid syndrome, like actual clots. You can develop, um, inflammation of your spinal cord, which can have sort of uh, characteristic symptoms. So pretty much any structure in the, in the brain can be impacted by lupus. Generally, it doesn't happen on its own. It's usually in a setting of high activity of your lupus elsewhere. So you're gonna have some, some, some blood work, some symptoms of a flare elsewhere, um, but it's, but, uh, um, and, and sort of having it previously is a risk factor for having it again. Um, so uh, the answer is that it is relatively common how impactful it is to you and how we treat it just varies significantly based on the specific manifestation. In some cases, it might just be observation or treating you know, with um, pain medications or anti-migraine medications if it's sort of a routine headache. Sometimes the headache is so debilitating you worry about a meningitis. Obviously, then there are other cases that require significant high-dose steroids, other sort of immune suppressants that oftentimes require hospitalization. So um, there's a broad spectrum. Yeah, and I think um, some of it can be what we term neuropsychiatric, yeah. so um, a, a little bit more in how you think. Um, that, that can also be really hard to, to tease out. So sometimes um, your rheumatologist may um, ask to have you get tested, like do, do neuropsych testing to help sort of tease out if they think that there, there is some involvement um, um, of, of, your, of your brain. Um, so I think that if you have any concerns about that, you could ask your, your uh, rheumatologist about that. And then the other thing I think um, we both encounter and we always want to make sure of is that infections can often mimic a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. um, um, and mo a lot of lupus patients are going to be on something beyond Plaquenil. Also, if your immune system is already suppressed, um, infections could mimic a lot of these things. So especially when it's these kind of symptoms. Um, and it's a significant symptom, that's one of the main concerns is ruling out an infection first just because the treatment would potentially could make an infection worse if we're not, you know, ruling that out, so. Um, so there's another question that says, what are 504 plans? And I'll take that since um, that's, it's basically a, a school, uh, a state mandated um, program that if, um, your student or child who has lupus, or your your um, um, young adult uh, in college, um, if you need um, extra help uh, be, uh, during school, uh, they're required to have a meeting uh, with all your teachers and to discuss, you know, what uh, implications from um, your um, disease might have um, uh, at play uh, or impact on um, your schooling and, and then try to help support you through your school um, and your education trajectory. Um, and so it's actually very helpful and a lot of people are on 504 plus. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to have to be on one if um, some people are not, but, and it's not necessarily just limited to, to lupus, it's actually all illnesses and diseases. Um, so it's sort of a, a broad, Sorry, uh, uh, broad overview of 504 plans, um, and, and it's it's really associated with 
a school uh, state mandated mandated school support basically um, I do want to also just touch upon that um, every college has an office of uh, college or upper level education um, has a office of student disabilities uh, that if you have a chronic illness like uh, lupus you can then go to um, to to talk to them about um, it's fully confidential um, but then they also can offer help with regards to scheduling and housing. Sometimes um, our patients are on immunosuppressive meds, so we don't want them sharing a, a, a bathroom with 20 other people. Um, and that can also be accommodated. So, um, you know, parking and all sorts of things, which you know, I think a lot of students don't know that exists, um, can be very helpful. The next, we have another question coming in. Um, why does fatigue affect so many patients with lupus? Um, that's a good, it's a good question. I think people are really interested in looking, I don't know if it's known specifically the underlying sort of pathophysiology of exactly why that happens, um, but it's ex extremely common in patients with lupus. Um, it tends to sort of, um, some cases correlate with higher disease activity, but in other cases, patients can be otherwise feeling fine. They just have this lingering sense of fatigue and that can be difficult to treat um, the good news is that in general this tends to be to fluctuate and there are periods of improvement um, and sort of feeling closer to your normal self and then it can get worse over time. It doesn't tend to necessarily always stay constant. The key question is when it's a non-specific symptom of fatigue um, or do you have other symptoms of a lupus slur at the same time and um, with fatigue you want to make sure you're ruled out other causes that can be prevalent in patients with lupus. So fibromyalgia is a pain application syndrome and sort of a heightened sensitivity to pain that um, is fairly common in, in patients with lupus. Um, and so that can sometimes cause significant fatigue, oftentimes tender points are a feature of that disease. So you and your rheumatologist would wanna help evaluate for that, um, make sure that's not what's going on. Um, a low thyroid state can mimic a lot of symptoms of lupus. And again, things can coexist with lupus. It's not always related to your lupus. So making sure your thyroid, again, this doesn't have to be checked every visit. This is something that if it's been normal and the symptoms haven't changed, not necessarily worth repeating if it's been done sort of in a relatively recent time frame. But looking at that, vitamin D deficiency generally doesn't cause significant fatigue, but if it's extremely low, it could potentially play a role. So, and patients with lupus are, for a good reason, you wanna minimize your sun exposure. And so you're more prone to being vitamin D deficient in as general. So that's, sometimes I, when I do check it, I'm, I'm surprised and to a degree, but not, not completely surprised, but that we do see vitamin D deficiency as well, and making sure that's treated could help with the fatigue. Um, but ultimately, if you don't have other signs of active lupus, it's generally not recommended to increase someone's immunosuppression purely for a symptom of fatigue. Um, I think it's unproven that that has benefit, and also there's a lot of side effects with increasing somebody's immunosuppression, and the sort of the benefit-risk ratio is um, not ideal. So ex regular exercise, sort of um, healthy eating, regular sleep, all of these sort of things that um, we recommend in general, sort of doing these on the side would generally probably be helpful for fatigue as well, in addition to the other things I was sort of uh, mentioning. I think the other thing to also remember is that um, you need to get enough sleep. So um, if you don't, if you're not sleeping well, that can sort of throw off a lot of different things um, and cause um, sort of a chronic fatigue like syndrome um, so making sure and even if you're feel like yeah you, you've gotten nine hours of sleep if not have seven of those that like you're waking up in between um, clearly that's not restorative sleep and so sort of evaluating if you're actually getting a good a good en uh, enough sleep and restorative sleep is very important um, and I highly recommend uh, sort of looking into that as well um, for a cause of fatigue I think we're going to go to one of our questions from the past, uh, okay. sure. as best we can there. Okay. Um, I have one from Jamie. Can your location affect your lupus? I seem to feel better when I'm near water or in warmer temperatures. So generally it's it's been sort of observed that sort of changes in barometric pressure probably. So when you're going from a dry to a wet climate or, uh, for example, that can tend to flare lupus. Um, oftentimes, and it's not specific to lupus, patients with rheumatoid arthritis as well, the joints seem to do worse in colder weather. Um, 
and then sort of as you know winter turns into spring the joints um, tend to feel a little bit better so these are well established so if you're experiencing these symptoms you're not alone this is a common phenomenon um, and so obviously financial other life situations may not permit somebody to move from a colder climate to a warm climate specifically for this indication but if there are ways you can do that and, and you do notice a major difference I mean that that's something that is established that may help to some degree with your symptoms um, can we try answering that lesions one as best you can? So we have a, a question as well um, re regarding uh, from a patient who states that I'm visually impaired, have had lupus for over 40, for, for over 40 years, and now my brain is full of small vessel blood clots. Um, I have lesions everywhere in my brain. Um, I also have diabetes, high cholesterol, a number of heart conditions. Um, and she states that her, her rheumatologist is, is, is putting me on cell septs. Um, also known as mycophenolate, um, and um, the patient wants to know more about it. Is there, are there any side effects to this medication, and can I get rid of any of these blood clots, blood clots in my brain? Um, so, Celsept um, is actually fairly frequently used in, rheumat in rheumatology and in lupus. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to know specifically in, in, in this case, are these I'm assuming at this point that the rheumatologist is deciding on the medication of Salsep that they feel that the clots and the inflammation in the brain is directly related to the lupus. Um, and I, I, so in that scenario, um, sometimes we do use Salsep for these, these kind of circumstances. We do sometimes use, depending on how extensive it is, how, much, how, how rapidly it evolved, how much impairment is, is, is going on high dose steroids concurrently. Sometimes we use stronger medications in cell steps, such as a medication called cytoxan um, or even rituximab. So the specifics of that will just depend on more. It's hard for us to know the specifics of the, of the case beyond what you, what's been described. But if we're a, maybe a slightly milder case of that, cell step would be a reason, potentially would be a reasonable medication. In terms of side effects, um, like all immune suppressant medications, sort of the main side effect is an increased susceptibility to infections. Um, common ones and sometimes more what we call opportunistic or infections that you otherwise wouldn't develop. Um, more sort of short-term things, it can often cause diarrhea or GI upset. So we typically would, your rheumatologist, if, you, if he, was going, he or she was going to start you on this, would start you at a low dose, typically build the dose up every week or so to a target dose. And that should help limit the side effects from a stomach standpoint. Taking it with food is generally recommended. If you don't tolerate even with the best of all these trials and all the best of circumstances, if you don't tolerate it for this indication, there is a form called mifortic, which is like kind of a coded form that can be better tolerated. It's thought to be pretty much the same in terms of its effectiveness. Um, and then, like a lot of our other medications, you have to get routine lab monitoring while you're on this. It could affect your blood counts, your liver tests. So it's not a medication that you start and then you sort of you not monitor on. You do need pretty frequent monitoring on it. Um, but again, if, if in the right circumstance, this may be a medication that could um, help with the blood clots. Typically, the blood clots resorb themselves over time, so the medication wouldn't necessarily get rid of the blood clot, but in as much as the blood clots are underlying due to inflammation from lupus, it will halt the inflammation or block that, because inflammation then leads to scarring, and you don't want more scarring, because that part gets irreversible, so as long, that, that's really where the cell step would play a role. Yeah, so I definitely think treating just the blood clots is not necessarily the goal. Right. Yeah, because um, that um, that will get better on its own, um, and when you treat the lupus, it gets it improves the inflammation that caused the blood clots. And the key Absolutely. question is, they should ch check your antiphospholipid antibodies if this is truly you're having blood clots, just to make sure, because that's fairly common in lupus, and if that's active potentially beyond immunosuppression, some in some cases we do also treat patients with blood thinners for certain clots as well. So, um, but again, this is something that's best discussed with your rheumatologist. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to ask you, since you're talking about APS, um, yeah. what, what is the, how common is antiphospholid syndrome with lupus? Don't have the exact don't the number, uh, number, although it's up to, so antiphospholipid itself, up to like 40, 50% of yeah, non- that's what I would Non like isolated cases of it are um, uh, a, a lot of those cases are associated with lupus. So in so much as the things that we see in our field 
lupus is the closest association. Um, it's not extremely common, but it's, it's, it is common to have both. Uh, it's more common actually to have what's called anti, just positive antiphospholipid antibodies circulating. Um, and so that's sort of a, a step down from full-blown antiphospholipid. So that means that people with antiphospholipid have actually had an event. So they've had a blood clot like in the vein or an artery clot or um, a miscarriage or a pregnancy complication. But you can have just the antibodies and hopefully never have any of those events. And that's actually fairly common in lupus. And, and so the treatments markedly differ in terms of if you've had an event or not. But um, it, it, is, it, is, it is fairly common and we, we see that um, not infrequently in our clinics. There's actually a follow-up question that I'll just jump in with. It, it's how much, uh, we're, we were talking a little bit about sleep. How much sleep would you consider enough um, and I think that um, it's somewhat depends, unfortunately, on, on you know, individual people. Um, I think what might be more helpful is to think about maybe um, considering a, a sleep study of sorts, so then they can actually analyze how long you're in the, the restorative sleep um, section of your sleep. Um, and that's gonna be more telling, um, not just the actual number. Um, and, and kids, putting my pediatric hat on, um, kids need at least nine hours, if not more, a night, uh, especially teenagers. So we really try and have our teenage lupus uh, patients uh, get enough sleep. But, I, I, but with regards to just in general, some people are okay with six, some people are you know, okay with eight. Um, it really just depends on the person. Um, so again, a sleep study might be more helpful to, to look at that. And then also on the sleep, maybe this, this question about when to take the Plaquenil and if it affects. So a question was, should Plaquenil be taken in the morning or afternoon or evening? And when taking it at night, sometimes it adds to the fatigue, or that's what I feel. If you take it at night, it adds to fatigue? That's what one of the people was asking though. Okay, but you want to go to sleep, so. Uh, that's true, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we have patients taking it all, all all day, different parts a day. Um, sometimes people take it once a day. We do have sometimes people take it twice a day. Yeah, um, I, yeah it, it just it depends. I mean, it, it's sort of a weight-based medication. So patients who are on a higher dose often split the dose. Mm -hmm. Some of them don't want to remember to take it twice, so they'll take it all at once. I don't generally notice um, that there, there really isn't a specific time of day to take it. Just taking it regularly is more, the best than, time. Is more, than, is more is the best time. Um, <laughs> So I don't know, I haven't seen it sort of contribute to fatigue from, from my patients. And I haven't heard that either. Um, but whether you take it morning, afternoon, or evening, just taking it regularly, I guess, is a, is a key take home. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you have any sort of sensitivity? So yeah, um, yeah so there's a question. So the question is, what is photosensitivity? Is it only, oh, with natural light or artificial light can also cause it? So some artificial light can also mm -hmm. induce photosensitivity, um, but I mean, by and large, statistically, sort of your risk in general that you're gonna be exposed to is gonna be the sort of natural light, and it can be both UVA, but especially UVB light. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's, it's, it's very common to be photosensitive in lupus. Um, it's... Uh, and what they, I think they wanted to know what photosensitivity is. Photosens so, photosensitivity, so photosensitivity basically means sort of a sensitivity to light, but specifically that can take different forms. Sometimes it's very specific, like you're out in the sun, um, and it doesn't have to be like you're out for two days straight, but you're out in the sun for a, sort of a routine um, outing, and you develop a specific rash, like the butterfly rash of lupus. That's clearly a photosensitive induced rash. We know it sort of is induced by that. A lot of lupus rashes are photosensitive. So by definition, that person would be photosensitive. Um, but even just feeling just completely different when you're out in the sun, so just feeling drained, nauseated, or just sort of feeling, feeling sick. sick or off, that's something we ask about, and so, so, so we try to ask it in different ways to sort of see if that's a feature that's not necessarily specific to lupus, but it's a common feature in lupus patients. And if they do have photosensitivity, what can they do to protect themselves? So there's, yeah, so there's a, a lot of things to do um, for that. I mean, from a, just a uh, patient standpoint, uh, a lot of basically skin care and sun protection. So if you can do something avoiding the peak hours of sun from like 10 to four, 10 in the morning to four at night generally, and finding another time, that's sort of when the maximum sort of UV exposure is. So find ways to do it around that. Sort of wearing loose fitting clothing, um, 
some this can be helpful. Sometimes if it's if you're very photosensitive, particularly on the scalp or on the face, like a, a wide brimmed hat, um, applying sunscreen, reapplying sunscreen, being very vigorous about it, like an SPF at least 30, but 50. Mm -hmm. Sometimes certain products like like tight, I think like zinc, titanium, titanium oxide. dioxide or zinc oxide mm -hmm. products may in some cases be more helpful. Um, yeah, and uh, and dermatologists recommend really reapplying every two hours. Yeah, so it's um, not good yeah. enough to just you're out Five for the months, day yeah. and then you're done. Yeah, especially with somebody with who has lupus. So. And there's definitely SPF um, in, um, infused clothing, and so you can definitely buy those. But interestingly enough, I also found a um, a RIT dye that has it's called Sun In. I think it's called Sun In. Or sun Out. I can't remember exactly. I, I can look it up. Yeah. But it um, where you actually wash your the clothes with the, the dye and it becomes some protective for like 60 washes or something like that so it's cheap it's right. relatively inexpensive and and um and uh very very helpful um but but definitely i think it's very important to to practice some protect protection um, for our lupus patients and we we say this a lot especially if you're in a sun belt right where you're in a, s a state that has a lot of sun um even if it's a cloudy day there's still uv rays and so you need to have, you need to basically have SPF in your lotion or, you know, just you put it by your toothbrush so you know every day when you brush your teeth, you gotta put your sunblock on and really make it as regimented as possible. Um, Cause I think it's really important. We actually interestingly also see, it's not quite photosensitivity, but definitely um, with ex uh, prolonged sun exposure, we actually see flares, right? So we yeah. do know that when you have um, sun exposure, in lupus patients, you can uh, you can actually cause more flares, and and we definitely see um, sort of in this October time period. So after a few months, after a whole summer time, um, people will come and you know and, and not feel as well and potentially have a little flare, probably because you know they got probably more sun exposure than you know the rest of the months. And, and plaque oil can actually be helpful, in, obviously in general for lupus, but also for photosensitivity, it can help mitigate some of that risk. But again. It's not enough to just be on that medication. A lot of these things that we were talking about doing um, with, with just being smart about reapplying your sunscreen and, and just taking these things, uh, doing these things rigorously will go a long way to reducing your risk of having a photosensitive episode and, and less likely to cause a flare of your lupus as well. It's called Sun Guard oh. from, from RIT and it's a UV protectant. Okay, I was looking well, I sun Guard. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> There's actually a lot of sun protective. You know, I think people recognize that sun is, you know, there's some other issues with sun, not just, just photosensitivity. So there's a lot out there, which is actually really nice. Um, did you get any of these, or can you do it? Yes, sir. How common is Raynaud's? Um, so Raynaud's is um, uh, basically when your blood vessels and your extremities uh, constrict down and sort of you lose your, the blood flow to, to the extremities. Um, it's typically a tri triphasic, which we call three-color um, process, where you know it will, will it will start to constrict down and it'll be blue, and then when there's no blood flow, it becomes white, and then when you have reopening of the the, the blood vessels um, and blood flow comes back in, it becomes red, and a lot of times that sort of re blood flow um, is very painful, and actually it can, it can be painful in any of those steps uh, as well. And you can see Raynaud's um, sort of in itself without an autoimmune disease like lupus, but a lot of times we see it associated with lupus as well. Um, and I think there was another question with. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry, are there common, common triggers? triggers? Oh, common triggers. So I think the most common is um, is the, the ch change in temperature, so cold. So it doesn't necessarily mean um, that it's it's worse. It, I mean, I guess it can it will be worse in the winter, but um, but even just the change in temperature. So if you're like outside and it's 80 degrees and you go into a super you know refrigerated you know uh, place or, or um, you, know, you open up the freezer and you have to be in the freezer for a while even that change can cause it too um, in addition to cold um, I think anxiety or stress can cause it um, what other smoking can make it smoking. worse I don't um, to see that much and then it's certain people who like their job if they're they work in it with like drills right. or vib vib vibratory vibration, things, yeah. vibration yeah. can trigger it. Yeah. Um, and like Dr. Lee was saying, I guess in, if somebody who has, if you have established lupus, say you, your lupus was diagnosed when you were 30 and you've had Raynaud since you were 
kid or your teens, it's possible you have what she was saying, there's like the primary Raynaud's, which is not necessarily associated with lupus or auto, autoimmune disease or secondary, but oftentimes then when you develop lupus or an autoimmune disease, the Raynaud's may get worse. So um, sort of the features that are concerning, we don't usually see, in, I don't usually see with lupus, but um, some of our other autoimmune diseases you see, you can get actually like actual skin breakdown or ulcerations. It, it can be more than a nuisance or a painful phenomenon. It gets so, the blood flow gets so decreased that you can actually get damage to the, to the fingers. Fortunately, that's pretty uncommon in lupus, but um, so it's, it's just important to be aware of, um, of those symptoms. There are obviously treatments for it. Um, you can take some medicines to open up the blood vessels. Um, you can actually, there's um, some creams that are also sort of blood pressure medicines that open up the blood vessels that you can put. And a lot of times people put like in their interweb um, areas of their fingers and to help again try to open up uh, things to the, to the their extremities or their toes um, so there are um, options for, for therapy as well yeah. usually and, and usually um, just sometimes even wearing gloves or wearing layers mm -hmm. uh, just being cautious and knowing the things that trigger it for you um, can be enough to make it tolerable or make it so it's not a major issue. And then sort of the next step, that, yeah, is, is some of those medications. And they're often fairly well tolerated, so uh, we do go with those sometimes. Yeah, and keeping your core temperature up is really key because uh, a lot of times, and I, I always tell everyone, even though we're talking about the hands and the feet, you actually, if you keep your head warm, your core temperature goes up. And so wearing a hat actually does help with three nodes um, as well. Oh, so what type of exercise should a diagnosed child be doing and then, or slash adult, or adult, or adult, adult. exercise? So, um, and I think this sort of goes without saying, um, we are big proponents of keeping um, up, up, upright and moving. Um, and so ex any exercise is good. I mean, I think, especially for lupus patients that, you know, may be on uh, steroids and um, there's a low risk for osteoporosis or low bone density and so weight bearing exercises are, are good if you can if your joints can can um, can tolerate that um, we don't necessarily say push to, to pain but we definitely do um, recommend um, regular exercise for um, even patients with arthritis and just non weight bearing and swimming or those kind of things do you guys want a break or do you want to keep going or yeah, half an hour. yeah we have half an hour left you're okay. Keep keep going. Going. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I mean, in, in a, for adult patients, for exercise, generally low impact exercises, but things that are going to be weight bearing in general are going to be helpful, especially in our patient population. We see a lot more either age related or steroid side effects, medication related, you know, osteopenia, which is sort of low bone mass or, or osteoporosis. So, as much as you can exercise to sort of maintain your bone health is helpful. Things like, it doesn't, and it doesn't have to be, there's no one specific exercise that you have to do. It's, it's generally, you know, if you're somebody who doesn't exercise much, finding something that you do like and keeping with that is, 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 is more important than any one. But things like walking, biking, swimming, or even yoga, tai chi, all of those can be really helpful. Um, and uh, uh, again, just um, building up to, to a sort of an adequate regimen and then knowing your body, so if you're in the, in the midst of a major flare, like Dr. Lee's saying, you shouldn't really push your body to the limit. That can exacerbate a flare, particularly if it's an arthritis flare. Um, but at the same token, you shouldn't be scared away from exercising. And in fact, you know, we, we, especially if you have sort of other a chronic illness like lupus, you want to keep physically fit and as much as you can, have, find some time, several days a week at least, to, to engage in physical activity. Um, lung disease. Let's talk a little bit about lungs. So you the, like lungs? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, the lungs are, are, are fairly commonly involved in lupus, and you can get involved in a really any of the structures in the lung. Um, so the actual lung tissue itself, you can get what's called interstitial lung disease, um, which is uh, uh, a, a lung disease that um, generally it doesn't look like an pneumonia for the most part, but it, it's sort of more of a widespread, hazy appearance to the lung. 
Um, you would notice it as probably just sort of feeling short of breath, sometimes a chronic cough, and that would trigger your rheumatologist to um, uh, look into some imaging studies to further evaluate that. Usually a chest x-ray is not sufficient or specific enough to diagnose that, so we're really talking about getting a CAT scan, and there are very specific features on the CAT scan that your rheumatologist, along with a lung specialist, can figure out to diagnose it. And there's subtypes of that. Some are more um, treatable, some are, are sort of later on, later stages of it, but um, if it's detected early, it can be a fairly well a, a tr treatable uh, complication of lupus in the lungs. Um, it tends, fortunately, not to be particularly common in lupus. Um, there are some other autoimmune diseases, such as scleroderma, that is much more common, and so that's one um, good aspect of it. Um, you can get inflammation of the lining around the lungs. It's called pleuritis, because the pleura is the lining around the lungs, and that's often like feeling short of breath with taking deep breaths. It can be actually really, really painful. Um, can happen on its own or with a flare of lupus. You may or may not have fluid around the lungs when, they, when you get, do a chest x-ray, for example, but um, this tends to be pretty easily treatable. Um, the treatment depends on what else is going on. So if your kidney function is okay, oftentimes like an ibuprofen course will help, sometimes steroids. Um, you can get, um, so those are, so you can have pulmonary hemorrhage, you can, so you can yeah. have a little bit of bleeding in your lungs that you can yeah. see. That's pretty rare. Um, I have a question about yeah. um, the lungs. If you have like GERD yeah. or um, stomach issues and yeah. the acid, you can get an aspiration. Yeah, and it backs yeah. up into your lungs. Can mm -hmm. you touch on that a little bit? Yeah. So whether you just have significant reflux and that's secondarily going into your um, lungs, or you have, you know, a issue with like the, the, you know, the, the motility or the movement of your esophagus that makes it more prone to getting uh, stomach contents in the, in the lungs. That's all, always a consideration is that, and sometimes just a pattern of what it looks like on a CAT scan and knowing you have those risk factors could, could suggest it's more due to what's called aspiration or stomach contents going into the lungs. It's not actually truly a primary lung issue and that, that can happen as well. And, and so treating the underlying reflux aggressively and medication-wise and non-medication-wise can help with that. Um, and then like Dr. Lee was mentioning, there's pulmonary hemorrhage, like bleeding into the lung, which can be a, typically or it's a hospitalized, acute, severe complication of lupus. Fortunately, not particularly common. Very common. Um, there's another uh, very acute type of lung involvement um, called acute lupus pneumonitis, um, which again requires aggressive management and making sure it's not due to some like an infection or another cause. Um, those are probably the, the main lung findings um, that, are, that are seen in lupus. And again, mo for the most part, patients with lupus will have milder forms, sometimes what's called the pleuritis, um, self-limited or short-term yeah, chest pain that can be treated. So um, yeah, so we, we do see that fairly frequently. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna jump back to one of the questions we had earlier before, mm -hmm. the question about uh, reporting their pain levels and how to use the 10 point pain scales in the first questions we had there. Huh. Basically they said that, um, they feel like they might be under-reporting, and is there any advice on how to give, how to really use that scale? I, it, it's, I think it's hard, right? Because everybody has um, their own take on, on, on pain. It, what might be helpful is to make sure whoever's looking at the scale uh, after you, you fill it in and, and understands um, what that means. Is it pain due to that day, pain that week, right? Pain the last month, right? Um, also, is it the worst pain you ever had? You know, so like putting a little context in it would be helpful when you're talking to your provider. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, I think uh, it is good in, in some ways, but I think you have to you have to be maybe a little bit more um, uh, more informational uh, with it. Uh, but I think in general, um, it really is sort of your I, in some ways some just of like, you know, how is your pain? Um, and I would usually say 10 is the worst pain you've ever had and zero is no pain is sort of the context. Um, but again, I think everyone's pain uh, interpretation is different. So it is a little bit difficult. It's difficult and then it's, it's easier if, if you're, you establish a relationship with a rheumatologist mm -hmm. so they're seeing you on multiple visits. Right. So, you, so they can follow it up so it tends to track better if it's, because it's more consistent and, and, and you, and obviously you developed a relationship with them so they kind of know, they can ask the questions, do you feel comfortable sort of giving the specifics and the context is, you know, maybe at that exact moment when you're seeing them, your pain is better, but, and so maybe technically you would report it as less, but if over the last week, which is probably more informative, 
most of the time you've been dealing with significant pain and then that's helpful and again knowing that 10 typically is referring to like the worst pain you can imagine so using those skills and you may be able to calibrate your pain score to more um, closer to what it what it is and help help us better treat yeah. you. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think I like the idea, the idea of the trending, right? Because if I see a patient and they every time I see them, they're sevens, but they're like talking to me like I'm talking to him, right? So that then I know that's her seven, you know, but she's not writhing on the floor, you know. Whereas someone else's seven might be right on the floor. So again, I think sort of knowing your, your patient is, is helpful and, and having that sort of um, consistency um, and continuity, I think is helpful. Yeah. And another question we got a lot of in the, earlier was about yeast infections and UTIs. Like, mm -hmm. is that how that relates to lupus and if it can be from the medications? So it's well established that patients with lupus have a higher rate of infections. Um, so, and that includes urine infections and yeast infections so um, I'm not aware that it's not really a direct effect that the lupus itself is inducing the infection but just the immune system even if you're not on heavy-duty immunosuppression those will significantly increase those risks but just mm -hmm. having lupus your immune system is dysregulated not quite right <laughs> a little bit. not quite right not quite right like no your immune system is not quite right not quite right yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, so yeah to define dysregulated yeah <laughs> so so just having lupus increases your risk, but again, how much that risk, sort of by what factor it is, it will depend on how immunosuppressed you are and how long you've been on it. Um, but, uh, and so in some cases, if you're significantly immunosuppressed, uh, what normally would be a routine yeast infection or, or, or say a urine infection, if we're talking about a urine infection, could be sort of a upper, you know, a, a more significant uh, urine infection that would require IV antibiotics, for example. So these are things that we, take into account and it's important for you to ask questions and just be an advocate for your own health and your rheumatologist will also always be sort of reevaluating do you need to be on this much medication is your lupus well controlled enough could we always are finding sort of the right balance between you know how much do we suppress your immune system and do you, do you still need that much amount just because these are real risks to have infections there are also certain um, immunodeficiencies that you can see in lupus um, that may predispose you to have um, uh, recurrent urinary tract infections too. So might might be interesting to, uh, to, to ask your rheumatologist uh, if you know they're considering that. Um, we have patients that have C2 deficiencies that have a lot of recurrent um, UTIs. So so I think that also could play into it. But again, it's it's sort of the it's the balance of your immune system being a little kind of off off yeah. balance um, and what that does to, to, to you and how you fight infections. And that might tie into the other thing we've gotten a lot of questions about, it's about itchy palms and mm -hmm. feeling of skin and just itching kind of in general, people with different things. Yeah. Um, have you seen that a lot in adults? I have not seen a whole lot of itching or urticaria they call it, um, they have too. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't, personally I haven't seen, a, I don't see an over preponderance yeah, of hives with lupus. It, it, I do see it though, and it is more common just to have hives in, in lupus. It's been reported to be a little bit more common. Most of the time though, the hives are sort of like regular hives and the treatment is with you know, antihistamines or other things. The key thing with lupus to, worry, to, to be concerned about or that your rheumatologist will want to ask you about is sort of sometimes that hive can be due to inflammation of the blood vessels. It's something called urticarial. Urticaria is our word for hives, vasculitis, which is the term we talked about earlier in this discussion. And so if that's the case, usually the individual hives will last more than a day or so, each lesion before they heal. That's kind of a clue sometimes that it could be, and they tend to be more pretty painful. So those are sometimes clues into that, and that would be treated separately. Like that's treated like other forms of more aggressive lupus. But to have itching without an actual lesion, just to have generalized itching, I don't see that very frequently. If the question is more like itchy palms, peeling of the skin on their hands, um, it, it would just depend on it. your rheumatologist and evaluating you do you have a sort of a specific lesion that may you know, fit a specific type of lupus skin rash? If so, then treating that. But other things are common as well, like eczema or um, contact dermatitis. There's a lot of other things that could be not necessarily related to your lupus that you'd want to um, look into as a possibility for that. Is it normal for butterfly rash to turn purple with temperature change? Um, I think you can have color changes yeah. um, with temperature. 
I, I don't necessarily know that it's that regular. Yeah, I mean, the yeah, and then in the appearance um, is not always stereotypically the same color in general, and and, and all persons <coughs> as well. Um, with the temperature change, I'm not sure how much how common that is, but it's it's plausible that it could happen. Um, so I, I think I think um, if it is if it has all the other characteristics of a lupus butterfly rash, it's a, and it's and it's not sort of one of the mimics of a lupus butterfly rash, and there are a number of those. Um, I think it certainly is something that could be seen, but uh, I haven't seen much of that myself. And I don't think it's necessarily associated with something that's worse. No. Yeah, I, did, yeah. I don't know. I don't no. know that. No. Um, so yeah, there's a question about um, holistic approaches and complementary medicine, med medicine, medicinal marijuana, and um, how. And then I think it was, you know, what our views are on those. I mean, I think um, as long as you've talked to your rheumatologist um, um, and let them know, especially for the complementary medicine, I, I think it could be very, very helpful. Um, again, though, you, you need to let them know what, what <coughs> excuse me, what you're doing um, with regards to acupuncture, or taking herbs, or those kind of things. Some of the some of the herbs we don't we don't know what they are, and that could actually obviously. Um, affect your liver and your kidneys, and um, obviously um, that could be negative. And so I think you have to be really careful with that. Um, but I, as a whole, I have no uh, problems at all, and I think it does help a lot of people. Um, you know, and I think uh, I think everybody, you know, is if they're, if they're interested and, and want to, to try, I think that's there's nothing necessarily negative. I think you just have to be careful about um, sort of cleanliness with regards to making sure that whatever you're getting, you know, because um, you are immunosuppressed, so just like how, you know, how, how clean, how, where was it from, that kind of thing, um, um, and making sure that, you know, you're not putting yourself more at risk for infections, too. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. I agree with everything there. Um, it's certain sort of herbal medications, a lot of those are, again, we don't have a lot of data or specific data with lupus, for example, so it's hard to make sort of broad statements about some of those individual agents, but for some of the acupuncture and some of these other things, like again, as long as you're, you know, doing your homework and looking into the specific place you're getting that done, and um, it's it's safe, it's for you, the, the pl you've had it done and, and it's, it's been beneficial for you, I think complementing some of your traditional lupus medications, if you, um, is something that we do see, and in certain patients, it can be pretty, pretty helpful. I just saw another one. If a parent thinks that his or her child might have lupus, what can we do to get a correct diagnosis in order? Um, talk to your doctor, um, I think, and, and then you know potentially be seen by um, a pediatric rheumatologist. Um, that's the best. I think getting it. Going and getting a lab test doesn't mean that, and then they have, and your if your child has a positive ANA or you know one lab test that's positive does not mean they have lupus at all. I mean you really need to fulfill criteria and there's symptoms and there's um, um, it's not it's not just one one thing that will, that um, you can uh, um, have that that would um, be definitely lupus. So I think it's definitely you have to um, work with your your medical care. What if they're in an area that doesn't have pediatric rheumatology? That don't have pediatric rheumatology. States actually that don't. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, obviously, they can work with their their uh, their local pediatrician who could get in contact with the pediatric rheumatologist. There are adult uh, rheumatologists that do also. Almost oh home. oh, and we're back. We're back. Okay. <laughs> Some areas don't have pediatric rheumatology, yeah. and if the patient is sort of mid-adolescence later, yeah, it, they could definitely be seen by an adult rheumatologist. Um, um, and uh, there, you know, and then, then there's also places that will obviously see people from farther away too. You know, so I'm sorry, I'm not focusing on you. How okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> can a skin biopsy diagnose lupus? So. Um, so skin, so in several ways. So in, one thing to keep in mind is that lupus can be isolated to the skin. So there are forms of uh, lupus, such as discoid lupus or um, other types that don't necessarily always go on to form what's called systemic lupus, erythematosus, or SLE, what we typically think of as lupus. Um, so 
a skin each a lot of the different types of skin involvement in lupus whether it's the butterfly rash or again this discoid lupus which is a, a, a different type of rash that tends to be more on the scalp or a scarring rash they have very characteristic features on a biopsy so they stain for certain immune uh, complexes or immune proteins that can be fairly specific for lupus so a biopsy in the event that the rash itself doesn't is not quite classic can be helpful to kind of confirm a diagnosis and say a patient has a positive ANA you know has some joint symptoms maybe has one other feature but doesn't quite have everything and you're um, not sure if the if a rash on the cheeks is due to maybe rosacea or lupus a skin biopsy might in that scenario be helpful and, and, your, and your dermatologist would do that and if that was consistent with lupus that might sort of make somebody formally you know diagnose as lupus um, there's also a lupus band test. We don't. It's really, an older test. It's an older test. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's an older test, and that is supposedly definitive. Yeah. So right. if they do the lupus band test um, and it's a, you know, a staining of right. sorts, um, and it's positive, then that that is um, positive for lupus. Is what um, we've been taught. Right. <laughs> we don't. But lupus bands don't. Have, we don't, don't routinely do, do it anymore. Yeah. yeah. So we have one more question on the chat here, and then maybe we'll do wrap up. But what are your thoughts and experiences with Benlista? Mm. So, so I'm not sure how often in pediatric dermatology. We do use some. We we use it uh, in in certain select situations. So um, it's actually um, like the first FDA approved medication mm -hmm. for lupus in about 50 years. Believe yeah. it or not, that doesn't mean we're not using a whole host of other medications in lupus, but it is FDA approved. Um, and generally, the indications that I I tend to use it for, or I've seen it used as well, and I agree with is sort of what's been, it's been studied as. So that's always a helpful clue is what it's been sort of in, you know, rigorous sort of scientific studies, what were the types of patients it, it would be helpful for. So one thing it's not particularly necessarily been proven for is if you have significant kidney involvement with your lupus or you have what we were talking about, CNS lupus, some of those manifestations, and those are active and, you know, not sort of in remission, this is not necessarily, those were not the types of patients that were enrolled in the studies. So we don't know if it, would be helpful and probably is not necessarily the targeted treatment that you would want to use for that. But patients generally who benefit, who may benefit from Benlista would be somebody who, who has some disease activity. They're not necessarily extremely active, but moderately active. They're typically on Plaquenil. They're typically on maybe Cellcept or another immunosuppressant and often on some dose of steroids seven and a half, 10, 15, just a sort of a nagging dose of steroids, you can't get them off. You're worried about both as the provider and the patient, the long-term side effects of steroids. They also typically, um, features that it can be helpful for, are, for example, like the pleuritis we talked about or uh, chronic you know, lupus rashes, joint symptoms. And that sort of population who has some disease activity is on sort of standard of care, these other medications, and doesn't have sort of major kidney involvement, for example. Adding Benlista can be potentially helpful. Um, we know it works from a blood standpoint fairly quickly within like a month or so, like your lupus markers will improve. Um, in terms of how it makes the disease itself like clinically improve, um, in some patients it can take several months, six months even to fully take effect. So it's, it's, that's one thing to keep in mind is that it's not gonna be an immediate medication to take effect. Uh, it doesn't work in all patients either, but typically patients who um, fit sort of that profile, um, it's something we consider. Um, it's an infusion, so that's also something to keep in mind. Not all our medications are infusions. Some are obviously pills, so that may take an adjustment for some patients. Um, I believe it's going to become available on like a subcutaneous sort of injection within mm -hmm. the next year, year and a half or so. So that'll give more options for that. But I don't know, that's how I approach Benlista. So. Someone else talked about stem cell treatments. Do you know anything about that for lupus? Stem cell transplants. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was here. Um, yeah, just because we're talking about treatment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, question was yes, I'd like to hear about stem cell treatment for lupus. Um, results? What would would you recommend it? Any other details? So I I personally have not referred a patient for that yet. Um, there are a few studies, mainly within the last six to ten years. Um, that have looked into stem cell transplant for very, very select mm -hmm. situations. And it's really for sort of very severe lupus that's been 
that is failed sort of standard medical therapy. So failed, you know, high dose steroids, failed even like cy cyclophosphamide or cytoxin, which is like a chemotherapy drug or rituximab. These kind of patients, um, if you don't have another option for it, one thing to consider. Um, the studies that I'm aware of, none of them are, as of yet, were randomized studies. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. kind of uncontrolled studies, generally like 40 patients, 15 patients. So not a large sample and not sort of the most, you know, you know, you know, there are certain types of studies, study designs yet to be done. So I think with, with more data, sort of a more conclusive answer can be given. But as of now, for these very sick patients who have failed medical therapy, some centers and some would advocate it's one an option to consider. But keep in mind, it's not you get the stem cell transplant and, and things are necessarily okay. You can develop a relapse of your lupus even after that. You're getting a stem cell transplant, so you can get rejection of that similar to other kind of transplant. You're gonna be on medications to suppress that process from happening so you can get infections. Um, but then there are success stories in patients who have had uh, significant improvement with that. So I think in, the, in a very small subset of patients who have severe disease, who failed other therapies, if we do see like further studies with larger patient population, that it, it may be something in the future that would be more commonly accepted. Yeah, I think we just need more information about it. Um, I think it's definitely for specific populations now, um, and the ones um, uh, are the really sick ones that we can't treat, and um, they continue to have pretty de uh, significant disease activity. I've had one person who um, has uh, gone to stem cell transplant, um, and he's been doing well. Um, but again, I think there's a one end of one, so I, I mean, it, you can't you can't really make any heads or tails out of that, right? So. So I think it, um, you need to talk to your your rheumatologist about it, um, you know, and discuss it sort of on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, great. So we have about ten minutes left. So if there's anything else in the question stuff before that you really want to hit on, or if there's anything else you just want to say in or general, just to wrap up on yeah. on any advice that you might have for any of the patients that are. Well, I think we have a lot of advice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, anything, I mean, you know, anything. Everyone is very <laughs> grateful in the chat. So they're really yeah. happy. I think. Just the key, one thing to keep is that um, lupus um, is, is very individualized in terms of how it presents. Even for you as a patient, as you may well be aware, it can, it can change over time in terms of what it can affect. So just being, I guess patient education is really is the key to all of this, is being aware of the symptoms you're having, being aware of potential symptoms. Hopefully we've been able to go through some of the things that potentially can happen with lupus not to be you know, overly worried that this is gonna to happen to you, but just being aware that these are possibilities. So if you have a symptom, you're at least proactive about it and, and bring it up to your rheumatologist so they can sort of evaluate with you if this is a possibility. Um, and, and sort of treating these things aggressively and earlier is always gonna be more helpful. Um, um, and then I think one of the other take homes is that there's a lot of things in between visits that you can do, um, whether it's stress reduction and regular sleep, exercise, certain things with your diet, sun protection. There's a lot of things that go into lupus management that don't begin and end with the office visit or aren't solely related to being on one of our the medications we often prescribe. So doing a lot of those things and sort of advocating for that on your own um, can really go a long way to making you um, keep your lupus hopefully in, in check. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of reason, you're not alone you know, with lupus, so now with the, obviously, the internet age and everything, there's a lot of support groups, there's resources like that are great, whether it's Lupus Foundation of Northern California, Arthritis Foundation, ACR, which stands for American College of Rheumatology, they have patient guides on lupus, specific medications. There's a lot of resources to educate yourself. You just wanna be smart about using, you know, .org or .edu, a lot of these yeah. things. Because there you can also, as in anything, you can find a lot of information on the on the internet and, and and you just want to make sure it's it's reliable and not necessarily you know finding something that may or not may not have validity and, and needlessly sort of stressing yourself out about or being unsure about so um, so the, yeah so just taking advantage of those resources is, is, is helpful and I think just being your own advocate or your child's advocate I think is really important and, and don't forget to ask questions um, I think no question is a stupid question. I think um, you're learning this, and you know, a lot of times you don't have a medical background, so it's 
it's it's it's tough. So we, we, we get that, and I think asking questions is always really really helpful. Okay. Well, that's it.